So what I'd like to do, uh, we're going to start with the panel discussion. And uh, we weren't quite sure how this would work, but what we really wanted in each of our panels were uh, physicians and scientists. So sitting up there this morning, we have Dr. Barry Ramo, who's a cardiologist from Albuquerque and a TV personality, for those of us who know Barry well. Uh, Dr. Gottfried Schlag from Harvard, who's the head of the Division of uh, Cerebrovascular Diseases at Harvard, a neurologist and a researcher in music therapy who you'll hear speak uh, later today and tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Connie Tamino from New York. Uh, many of you know Connie. She's quite famous as the uh, music therapist that not only founded the program at Beth Abraham in New York, but has worked very closely with Dr. Oliver Sachs. Uh, Mark Nykrug, who's the... Uh, artistic director of the Chamber Music Festival, and uh, Dr. Huron, who you just heard speak. And what we've asked them to do, mixing musician and therapists and scientists, is to comment on the morning and what they heard and what they thought they heard, and also give you a chance to ask them questions and go back and ask the morning speakers questions as well. Now, we had planned at least a half hour or 45 minutes for these sessions. We don't have that, but we'll let this go about maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes and end about 12.10 and lunch is available um, out in the patio again for everyone. So, David, you spoke, so let's let Mark start, and I'm gonna let you guys rock and roll. Come on, Mark, you're always comfortable talking, which I know you're not, but that's okay. Is that, yeah, that sounds good. Um, comment on the morning. Good morning. <laughs> I agree. No, it, it's great. I uh, found myself attaching to a sentence here and a sentence there, which just sent me all over the place. So I will comment on one from my own perspective. And I don't know what this is going to do to anybody, but Beethoven and the deafness and the template, I would venture to say that almost every composer works much more with the template than with the hearing. Uh, my own method is writing actually on the floor. I like the floor because you can lay out pages. Uh, Varez, I know, had a clothes line with clothes pins so he could, because it's the pages that matter and you can walk. And I check things at the piano at the end of a day or the end of two days to make sure that they actually sound like what I imagine they sound. So the, the deafness is very fascinating to me because I would say, almost every composer probably worked more from that template. I like the word template, good, good word. <laughs> That's my comment. As a, as a music therapist, um, listening to the presentations this morning and knowing the presenters um, and have been, been in the field for close to 34 years now, this is extremely exciting. Uh, music therapists historically work with people who have some kind of deficit or some kind of need that could be addressed through music. We know in our many years of clinical work that music can address emotions and music can address mode of function and music can address cognition and language development and all those things. But we're always challenged to ask why and how it happens. And is there a strict protocol that can be replicated? So we know through experience uh, that yes, indeed, we can affect these behaviors very, very well. We want to be able to do it at a higher level. And we need the interest and the, and the very fine work of the scientists and the people in the field who can help us identify what are the areas that are universal, what are the networks that we excite when we stimulate memory, what are the networks that we excite when we stimulate language development. 20, I think in 1984, Dr. Sachs and I walked into a neuroscience lab and asked, can we study music in the brain? 
and the scientists looked at us, their jaws dropped, and they said, are you kidding? It's like, no way in the world, it's too complex, we can't single it out, all we can do is study clicks and beeps. I'm really ecstatic that we've gone way beyond that, and that these dialogues, like this particular meeting, is so essential to allowing many different disciplines to get together and really change how we look at therapy and treatment and how we look at science and, and how we're able to now translate that to real practice that can help many more people. Um, listening to um, Tomeno, um, I, I share the same um, optimism and, and positive uh, feelings about this field. On the other hand, um, being in a practical setting where one would actually test these inter interventions, I have to also realize, and I'm realizing, how difficult it actually is to go from what we heard here um, in normal individuals and what we heard about which regions of the brain are involved in music processing and music making and what kind of beneficial effects it might potentially have in normal people and what makes us different and what, what we share between um, animals and humans. Um, then take all of this and apply that to um, individuals that may be afflicted with particular disorders and then try and, and measure that and test it in the most uh, vigorous sense. In some ways, we are, I mean, I'm always envy in, in some ways of the music therapists because I feel like they're already so far ahead uh, in, in doing things and actually um, trying to make people better. But for a lot of the interventions, we're still lagging behind in actually proving um, how this might actually work. Um, and then in, in applying very, um, uh, rigorous testing to it, so coming up with, let's say, one music therapy type of intervention that we then test an intervention that would be similar but doesn't actually use music to actually prove that it is really music or something in music that could lead to that enhancement. So if you really think this through, and I'm not trying to be pessimistic about this, but doing these studies right is actually a very difficult thing. And only if we can prove that there is efficacy to a particular intervention that has particular, that uses particular components of music and music making, only then I think we will actually achieve wide acceptance of music type intervention to improve neurological disorders and neurological disabilities hopefully we'll be able to touch on some of that uh, tomorrow, but I think that is really the challenge to this field um, to um, translate all of this, what we heard today, um, to patients and to people with disorder and then test it in a, in a very rigorous way. Well, as a cardiologist and listening to all of this, it, it it was absolutely so exciting because in the field of cardiology, the role of music and what you're talking about really is outcomes, which is an essential part of everything that we do. It may sound like a wonderful idea, but we need some data to suggest that it's, that it's helpful. But what I, as I listened to all of this and I heard all of the four talks, I, I thought about the Parkinson's patients and then I heard uh, the discussion about the neurochemistry of, of uh, dopamine being increased in, in patients uh, who, were, who were pleasurably uh, enhanced by the, by the music. And of course, Parkinson's is a disease in which there is a deficiency of dopamine. And then we saw the video of the Parkinsonian patient who was able to, to walk to the beat. And, and as I listened to the sort of the interdisciplinary approaches of all the four, four discussants, one talking about uh, neurochemistry, the other one talking about the, the, clinical, the clinical effects of the, of the beat. It just seems to me that there's so much potential here. From a cardiac standpoint, we have at our hospital a harpist, and the data on playing music, for example, during cardiac surgery and after cardiac surgery 
is powerful in terms of recovery. So there is no question in my mind that music is medicine. We just have to figure out what music makes what people better and what people worse and, and, and be able to scientifically show that, it, that it's something that, that uh, will really engage everybody. So I find it, uh, I'm sure like everyone else, very exciting. I think we'd like to continue to take questions or comments from the audience. Um, I invite our panelists to continue to talk and, and raise points. And uh, feel free to not only ask our panelists questions, but any of the morning speakers. And I'll move with the mic to make sure that happens. Um, this is, was spurred by what you said, Mark. I have a friend who's a composer, and I asked him, how did you come by that? And he said, I've ne I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't hear music in my head. So that made me wonder about, I mean, we know that in the motor cortex, you can rehearse internally and not move and get effects. So in terms of what you're saying, in the auditory cortex, does the same thing happen? I mean, that's a generalization, but I'm wondering if in the auditory cortex, you create music or, or create the hearing of music first as a template. Does that make sense? So, so you're asking about do we have an auditory equivalent of muscle memory? Yeah, right. right. Yeah. And who might you be asking? Because <laughs> I have. Do we? Maybe, maybe Dr. Patel uh, or yeah, that, Dr. Zatori would like to comment on that. I think that's yeah. a fantastic question. Robert. Comment uh, a little bit, and actually, Peter has done some work on this as well. Um, but uh, we have a lot of evidence that um, the auditory cortex, in as part of a network with a whole lot of other uh, regions, is really essential for what we call auditory imagery, for this ability to imagine sounds. One piece of really old evidence is from a, a study that Andrea Halpern and I did years ago, where we looked at these patients who had excisions of the temporal cortex and we asked them to make judgments about music that they had to imagine. They had to imagine a tune and indicate if a particular note went up or down. And uh, they had trouble doing this, uh, whereas people with uh, similar excisions on the left side didn't have trouble doing this. And this difficulty went in parallel with their difficulty in actually perceiving those same sounds. So our, our contention is that the part of the nervous system that's involved in representing actual sound when it comes into the ear is also involved in, once you've had the representation that you've built up because you have a working hearing system, um, then you no longer need the hearing system because you can just access it directly. And this is why Beethoven could continue to compose and why indeed composers don't even need to hear anything because they're already, they've already created those, those uh, internal representations. I don't so, know if you wanna- So Robert, can I ask you to follow? And Mark, you could answer this question, I think. Is the ability to compose in your head something you learned because you had auditory experiences early in your life, or were you able to imagine that essentially as a composer born as an innate, is there an innate ability for a composer to hear that in the mind, or is that something acquired through the experience of hearing the sound? I think both, but in my particular case, you must imagine that my mother was a cellist. So nine months prior, I started not only hearing the music, but the vibrations were right where I was. Um, so there is that. But I, I've always believed that it's a and this is not scientific, it's just what I believe, that it's an accumulation of those auditory memories. You know, I memorize the sound of a clarinet from the bottom to the top and a flute from the top to the bottom, and I retain, try to retain those memories. So I think it's, a, it's both. I think there's one other point to this as well that, similar to what Robert said, a somebody that has actually trained to play a piece that when you play them this piece um, and you can just 
play the auditory signal of this piece or you can just show a video, they actually simultaneously activate motor regions um, at the same time while you can also do the experiment in reverse order and just show them videos of somebody playing a piece and they will get auditory activations. So we, we have these complex sensations that involve various regions of the brain and if we train in that system we can actually get activation or um, active activity in these systems even in the absence of the primary input. Yeah, I'm asking this question in the context of someone who knows nothing about this field and being a medical oncologist. And um, are there other pathways or chemicals that are affected by music, particularly signaling pathways, other important molecules? I'm happy to my colleague's question. Um, some of us in cancer particularly study signaling pathways in cells to understand how cancer drugs work to activate or kill a cell. I presume, how much science is known in the auditory, like the hair cells or the cells that line the actual auditory canal, how much science has been done about the pathways in those cells that signal that actually then transmit those vibrational frequencies to the brain? Is that science very advanced? I would ask maybe Peter or Ani or Robert or Michael to comment on that. Do we know a lot about how that even happens from a very fundamental cellular level? I'm seeing lots of yeses. Michael, do you want to comment on that? What we know about that? This is Dr. Michael Taut from uh, Colorado State. Uh, I'll try to speak in a low voice so I sound less. <laughs> <laughs> but I raise my eyebrows at the same time. So. <laughs> uh, this would get very complicated, but the auditory neuroscience uh, from, the, uh, from the, essentially the whole transmission from the environment into the cochlea and then through the auditory pathways uh, to the auditory cortex and also reticular spinal pathways, et cetera, et cetera, is pretty well known. It is uh, still very complicated. There are questions because it's such an abstract process. There are still questions people wonder about, but the essential neuroscience of that is known. The transmission neuroscience is well known. For those of you who will continue with us and will be honored to hear Dr. Tout later, he's one of the founders of the intervention of music uh, and motor control in neurologic disorders along with Dr. Schlag. So. We'll be hearing from them in the session tomorrow, which will be terrific. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. My question is actually for Dr. Patel, I believe, if he's here. Um, he is. But it, it also is built, I'm a pediatrician, and I really um, am interested in how we apply these things, and music in particular, to patients. I'm also interested in education. And so I was very interested in the link between rhythm and reading. Um, and um, while um, Dr. Patel said it was um, certainly an association, but not uh, really a cause, or that we couldn't link that, I know that there are reading programs that use rhythm to help children read. So I wondered what, um, because it would be profound for our children in the schools if there were a link or something that could truly help children learn to read, what the research actually is in that area that might link rhythm with the ability to learn to read and or, because you said it sounded like it's early and isn't done yet, and um, what you think the implications might be. Thanks. Yeah, I think it is relatively early days, and I'd love it if Laurel could chip in on this, because she's one of the people that's done some of this research. Um, but there's now, I think, a couple of different groups. There's your group, there's the Marianne Wolf's group at Tufts, there's Nina Krause's group at Northwestern that are really starting to coalesce around this question of is there some sort of systematic and replicable relationship between rhythmic abilities and linguistic abilities and Usha Goswami at, at Cambridge, University of Cambridge in, in England. And if there is, you know, what, how does it work in the brain? What is the cognitive mechanism? And there are these ideas about the mechanisms that track slow temporal fluctuations in, in acoustic signals, that the envelope essentially which delivers information about syllable segmentation and stress in language, and also about rhythm in music. And so maybe those are the underlying shared mechanisms. But as Laurel pointed out in her comment, you know, we're still at very early stages in first establishing the relationships. And I don't, you know, the, the finding out whether or not they're causal is an absolutely critical next step. And we just have to start doing randomized controlled experiments where 
That's the only way we can pin that down. But if, if those really do pan out, you're absolutely right. The implications are, are really profound, I think, for uh, early education. Yeah. And it should include prenatal. Oh. I think Dr. Trainer will talk about that this afternoon, and she's a foremost expert in uh, imaging and these sort of studies in infants and young children, so that'll be a great talk for this afternoon. Tim? You wanna... uh, this is a question for Dr. Satori, and, and maybe just an open-ended, almost naive kind of idea, but I heard this morning that uh, the re reward center in the brain is uh, stimulated almost identically by music as by uh, drugs. And uh, so would music listening, and I also heard about preferred liked or known music as the music to use, would music listening as a surrogate uh, be a surrogate in detox or addiction recovery? Uh, would an iTunes gift card be less expensive than detox drugs that are currently <laughs> administered? Because my understanding is that they are put on medication during that time, during that initial detox. And, if this is gonna affect that same place, is that too naive of a question or is Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm certainly not an expert on addiction, but I have a lot of colleagues who are, and um, I think the simple answer is uh, it's not that simple, because if it were, you could also just substitute food, for instance, for heroin, and it, it does not really work that uh, in that way. Um, that said, there may well be a role for music in some more complex intervention. Uh, I mean, the problem is, I think that the uh, the drugs are such strong um, uh, activators of that dopaminergic system that they actually override almost every other natural stimulus. Um, and I was mentioning earlier, one of the earliest demonstrations of uh, the the power of the system actually came from um, work done in the 1950s at McGill by Jim Olds and um, Peter Milner who famously showed that if you stimulate this region, uh, this dopaminergic center in the rat brain with an electrode, if you have the rat actually stimulate itself by passing a current in that area every time it presses the bar, it will actually stop eating and stop being interested in mating and uh, everything else because you're, you're getting a direct access to that system. So um, I wouldn't be uh, optimistic about a, um, a kind of a substitution type of approach, uh, but that's not to say that there may not be a role in some in some broader type of intervention. Connie, Connie, yeah, to respond to that too, I know of a scientist um, at Duke. I can't think of his name off the top of my head right now. Who's actually working with detox people who drug addiction with a, a clinic, and has actually uh, is using the the people's preferred music, setting it up as a ringtone, training them to consistently have a, a pleasurable response when they hear their music, and then has their phone program that music several times a day, like every 20 minutes to ring, and in fact is inducing um, ability for that person to get off the, their drugs. So if I, I'll email you the name, okay? Thank you, Connie. Yes, please. Um, my question is also for Zatori, um, and kind of dovetails into what you're saying is being done. Um, with regard to music and pleasure, the thought I had was um, it does happen that sometimes when you like something so much, you listen to it over and over and over again to the point of displeasure. Um, so what is happening there? Does the neurotransmitter shift over from the release of you know, the dopamine to something that induces pain? Um, a, pain neurotransmitter, and if there is an evolutionary reason for the production of dopamine, what would be the evolutionary reason for having something that was once pleasurable become painful? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, I think I would answer the first part of it at least in terms of uh, this concept of um, uh, reward prediction and expectancies, so that um, part of what I was talking about was this uh, interplay between uh, what you're hearing now and your ability to generate um, a prediction of what's happening, what's going to come later, and that's what really engages this reward system. It's the so-called reward prediction circuitry. Now, if you hear something over and over, it gets, depending on the music, of course, it comes to the point where there is no longer uh, anything to predict because you know it so well 
that you formed an explicit representation of every single event. And in fact, um, and I would venture to say this, although it may make me some enemies, that uh, a certain uh, large proportion of pop music is like this. This is why it, it's a hit for a while, but then after a while, nobody listens to it. And you know, right now, some of the music that uh, Peter was playing from the 1980s, yes, it might remind you of something, but no one listens to it anymore because it's boring. Why is it boring? Because there actually wasn't all that much to it in the first place, and once you've heard it enough times, then it, there's no longer any uh, reward that comes out of it. Conversely, music that's more complex, of whatever genre, doesn't have to be uh, of any particular genre, um, the fact that there's a lot going on in it means that you never tire of it, and then it, that's why it becomes a classic in whatever style of music it is. This, of course, also interacts with your own cognitive ability. So the more you personally um, have uh, a large array of, of stored musical knowledge, the more you'll be able to interpret and understand and therefore derive enjoyment from more complex music. Um, this is part of the reason why there's a barrier to certain kinds of contemporary music is because most listeners don't have the templates that are necessary and therefore can't generate those expectancies. And that music is boring for the opposite reason, not because you know everything that's going to happen, it's because you can't tell what's happening. You don't know what the next event is going to be. You cannot generate the predictions and therefore there's no reward and there's no pleasure from it. Please go ahead. Okay. I've got a couple of questions. One for Dr. Janata. In your studies, um, the studies with the younger people, versus the studies with the elderly. The younger people, I know you are using lyrical uh, lyrics to your music. What influence did that have, perhaps, besides the music? Does, because words have power, so does that influence? And did you use lyrics with, uh, lyrical music with um, the elderly? Yeah, so um, all the music, uh, well, 98% of the music uh, with the younger adults did have lyrics. And the, uh, so we haven't teased apart the contribution of the lyrics uh, uh, from the instrumental bits. Uh, actually, we've tried to look at that recently where we had code those moments in time in the music where there are lyrics and we do find some differential activation. Um, with the lyrics in the instrumental music, where actually the, the lyrics cause some uh, increased activation in the ventromedial prefrontal areas that uh, Dr. Zatori was talking about. Um, with the older individuals, uh, that was a, a mix of music, um, again, um, really targeted at their past and their various genre preferences. So. Um, I actually don't know for particular individuals you know, what proportion did have lyrics or didn't. Um, but obviously there are multiple interacting components that may uh, trigger associated memories or, or also the emotions. And if I could quickly ask uh, Dr. Kithail. Can I follow okay. up on that question? Because this is something very important that we I had the pleasure of hearing David and Ani talk about in September, and, and now uh, Peter and, and, and Robert Zatori have talked about it today, is what is it about the brain in that teenage phase? Seriously. Because one of the things, David, you talked to me about in September, and I've heard that theme in Peter's research, is that there's this window of time in that teenage, sort of early 20s time period that's so critical where we have so much memory and music laid down, is that the teenage hormone emotional ability thing that somehow is affecting the brain? What is the kind of physical chemistry and neuroscience of that? And then you talk about the prefrontal cortex being the less, the region of the Alzheimer's brain that's more retained. So I understand that that's where that's stored. But why is it during that phase of our life compared to early childhood or in my 30s and 40s, what is it about the brain and our physiological chemistry that actually makes that happen? Peter, do you want to? Um, so first of all, I, I don't think any of that's been very well established, but from observations on my 13-year-old son, um, I think I can <laughs> venture a guess. 
So I think you're, you're pointing to a hormonal role, and, and that's what really I don't think has been fully shown yet. But I think a large part of it is also the social component and the fact that um, music and music choice, you know, what you like, is a really large part of social identity building and social interaction. And these parts of the medial prefrontal cortex are particularly important for social cognition. So inferring what other people are thinking and, and integrating all of that with, with one's own emotional states. So um, I, I think the, when the research is finally done, it will show some sort of, uh, let's say, neurochemical or neuroplastic interactions with this particular part of the brain, I think largely because of the, the social uh, importance of the music uh, that one identifies with in that age. So I, I think that area is so fascinating. We all watch our early teenagers, I think most of us with children, become very music focused at that time. I would say a 10 year old not isn't maybe it's going to change, but doesn't walk around with their iPod or their old CD player. But a 13 or a 15 year old really does, and just really locks into that music. So the idea about hormonal chemistry, neuroplasticity of the brain, social relationships developing that's a to me a fascinating area that's probably incredibly complicated, but obviously critical for therapeutic intervention later. Connie, do you want to pick up You know, up it's on that? interesting because there's been research done in the field of music therapy. Alicia Clare at Kansas State many years ago uh, did a study on musical preferences in the older adults and the music that they remembered the best, and there's been other um, scientists that have done this as well, that the music that they remembered the best happens to be the music that was popular during their teenage and early adulthood years. So whether there's a pairing of both the emotional, the social, all those elements that we've heard this morning that makes a music, music so salient to our lives is still preserved in older adults when other aspects of memory seem to go. Uh, on that at all? I, I could say a couple of things. So there, there is quite a bit of research on what's called the reminiscence bump or re reminiscence bulge, and there's quite a bit of autobiographical memory. If you interview someone in their 80s or 90s and ask them to tell the story of their life, they'll spend a lot of time, disproportionate amount of time, and period between about 12 and 22. Um, uh, and there are some hormonal things. So it's known that oxytocin, which has this big, you know, it's the bonding hormones, the social hormone, but it also has this enormous impact on memory. And um, so there's there elevated levels during this um, period. So there's some speculation that oxytocin might be playing a role here. Uh, just very quickly, Dr. Patel, I know that uh, the video clip with the Parkinson's um, was not, it's one you referenced. Um, it was from Dr. Tomino. But, yeah. Yes, I know. Hi, <laughs> okay. mind you. I'm just wondering if you have found that different rhythms have different effects for on the Parkinson's, like is there a better rhythm to use to that's get really, them to move? That's a wonderful question. I'm going to pass it right on to Connie because she's the frontline investigator in that okay. area of research. Well, actually, um, Michael Talkin Michael, chime, yes. chime in on this too, but you know it's interesting because this rhythmic auditory stimulation, which is the use of rhythm to um, entrain motor function, is pretty consistent with people with different types of gait problems. So it can be generalized to some degree. Jessica Gron and others are showing that uh, perception of rhythm can be damaged in people with Parkinson's. So one of the things that we've done clinically is we always test people for their beat perception. Where do they feel the beat? And that seems to be a good predictor of which rhythmic type of cue is gonna help them. So you can't really generalize it to everybody because everybody's perception of where they feel the rhythm is different, I think. But I'm not a scientist in that regard, but Michael can chime in on this as well. Uh, I think uh, since um these interventions are really functionally oriented. You, you generally you start with the internal cadence. Where are they? Uh, 65 steps a minute. What's the stride length, etc. So it's a very straightforward process. It's nothing mystical about the rhythmic ideas behind it. You know, uh, so you look at this in a, in a very functional way. You translate essentially the kinematics into sound, and then you work from there functionally into proper cadences that are more functionally appropriate, where stride lengths, where other kinematic features become more regulated, 
So I'll speak to more about it tomorrow, and I think Connie probably has also some presentation on that. So it's, it's an interesting process, a very powerful process, but it's a, a very transparent process. Thank you. So our final question for this morning session. Sure. Uh, this, this is maybe a little bit of a footnote question to earlier discussion, but referring to the, the presentation on music and pleasure and dopamine, um, it seems like you know, we don't really talk about music as an addiction to music. So you can get addicted to food and sex and computer games and surfing the web, but maybe you can be obsessed with a certain kind of music or listen too much, but uh, do you have any thoughts about why we don't really seem to be addicted to music in that way of that loop that just goes destructively in circles. Well, I'm, I'm not really sure whether that's true or not. Um, there are lots, I mean, there were lots of obsessive behaviors uh, that people engage in, and some of them have to do with music. We've actually been thinking for a long time about how to test this, and I'm not sure if the um, Ethics Review Board would allow us to have people go cold turkey. And I'm also not sure how we could enforce it. But you know, there's just a practical problem. How would, how would we do it? But we have toyed with the idea of uh, taking, people who, taking people who say, well, music is so important to my life, I couldn't live without it, and actually testing it and seeing, well, what would actually happen? Would you show some withdrawal symptoms? It's possible. Um, if, if someone has an idea of how we can actually implement <laughs> such a, uh, a procedure, I would be, uh, I'd be interested to fool around with it. Well, it seems like the, you know, we don't, there aren't um, general public organizations that are against too many, you know, more than X hours of music a day or, <laughs> or the destructive uh, oh, that's, elements that's of music. That's not true. You know, the, the well, Taliban kids. famously banned music um, yeah, that's true. when they were in charge and, uh, you know, various organizations routinely talk about certain kinds of music, you know, that they don't want, usually they don't want their kids to listen to, so... Right, um, and it's not because of it's not because of the uh, the addictive potential, but it's more because of maybe some extra musical sorts of associations. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question. I think uh, most of these phenomena that uh, are related to the dopamine system uh, have uh, an extreme expression of them, where it can become potentially bad, whether it's obesity or whether it's drug abuse or whether it's alcoholism or um, people who are over-sexualized, etc. So it wouldn't really surprise me if there's a, a tale of that distribution where you know, people are engaging in music <coughs> to the detriment of their other, the rest of their lives. Thank you. Final comment. This is just kind of an open question, um, not related specifically to any individual speaker this morning, but um, there's been a lot of conversation about uh, music in the brain, and I was just wondering, does anyone know, is there any research being done in other cultures where if you look at the Ayurvedic medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, uh, they consider that every organ in the body has a vibration. So if you're considering music as a vibration, then that whole idea, um, you know, when you meet someone, it's probably not your brain that's going off. And they say, you know, it, it, you, they struck your heart or they had a nice feeling and all those kinds of comments like it's eating me up alive or uh, it broke my heart. You know, we now know that there's as many um, brain connections in the gut and the heart as there are in the brain. So, you know, is anyone studying how music is affecting those organ systems from, from the perspective of other cultures? David, do you want to take that? I give a brief answer because our lunch is waiting. There's, <laughs> gosh, there's, there's a lot there. Um, let, me, let me make just a very simple comment. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that makes this gathering so special is, is, as I said earlier, breaking down the barriers. And there's one other barrier that needs to be broken down, and that is with our colleagues in ethnomusicology. So many of the things uh, we study, uh, you know, 90% of the studies that I do are with uh, American undergraduates from central Ohio. Um, we do do some, some work in Micronesia and other places, but uh, there is a, a difference in culture, I think, between people who come from anthropological backgrounds and uh, don't do more empirical work. Um, but time is running out. Time is really running out in terms of the possibility of looking at more cross-cultural things. And we really, that's another dialogue that really needs to take place. 
Well, I want to thank the fantastic speakers for the morning and make two comments. I'm, I'm so thrilled, and I know Mark is thrilled um, with how the morning has gone, and I think the sessions will build and the discussions will intensify, but it's just been fantastic. So I really want to thank everyone this morning for the great work.